Good morning, church. How are you guys today? So our first song is titled Brother, and I think it just has like a really deep message. I don't know if some of you guys have heard of it, but I think what really um, strikes me the most is that it says like, when you look into the face of your enemy, you can see your brother, not your actual like brother if you're, he's your enemy, but you see your brother, and I don't know about you, but it hurts me whenever my sister is in pain or whenever like she had a bad day, it like physically, or not physically, but it hurts me the same way it hurts her, probably even worse. And if you think about your enemy, would you ever feel hurt if they're like, oh, let's say they didn't make the basketball team? Would you feel hurt for them? No, you'd cheer for it, yeah, exactly. But I think this song just teaches us that when we look into the face of our enemy, we should see a brother or a sister or a family member. So um, keep that in mind as we um, sing our first song. And if you guys don't know the um, song, I encourage you guys to look at the lyrics and to just really um, think about it in your head. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother, I see my brother. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother, I see my brother. Forgiveness is the garment of our courage. The power to make the peace we long to know. Open up our eyes to see the wounds that bind all of humankind. May our shattered hearts greet the dawn of life with charity and love. Together. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother, I see my brother. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother, I see my sister, I see my father, I see my Mother, I see my brother. That was great. Um, for our next song, it's called By Your Side. And I think it's just really important to know that God is by your sides throughout everything. And I think um, it says that please don't fight these hands that are holding you. And I think like fight is a powerful word. And I think it's just it's just telling me like we shouldn't fight God even though like we think that we should we should just like embrace it and let him hold us and take us home. So just think about on these words as we look at the lyrics or if you guys know the song I encourage you guys to sing it with us. Why are you striving these days? Why are you trying to earn grace? Why are you crying? Let me lift up your face. Just don't turn away. Why are you looking? Why are you looking for love? Why are you so searching as if I'm not enough? So where will you go, child? Tell me where will you run? So where will you run? Cause 
Cause I'll be by your side wherever you fall in the dead of night Whenever you call and please don't fight these hands that are holding you My hands are holding you Look at these hands at my side They swallowed the grave on that night When I drank the world's sin So I could carry you in And give you life Yeah, I wanna give you life Cause I'll be by, by your side Wherever you fall in the dead of night Whenever you call and please don't fight These hands that are holding you my hands are holding here at my side Wherever you fall in the dead of night Whenever you call and please don't fight These hands that are holding you My hands are holding you I, I love you I want you Cause I'll be by your side whenever you fall in the dead of night Wherever you call and please don't fight these hands that are holding you My hands are holding here at my side Wherever you fall in the dead of night Whenever you call and please don't fight these hands that are holding you my hands are holding you Here in my side My hands are holding you Amen. You guys sounded amazing. Um, I encourage you guys also for our last song, um, Lead Me to the Cross. If you guys need prayer, I encourage you guys while we're singing to stand up in the front and um, we'll pray for you. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption still, for your blood was spilled, for my ransom, everything I've once held dear. I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. to the cross you were as I tempted and trailed you sin and death. May your risen everything I want to tell dear. I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me 
to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. Lead me to the cross. To your heart. To your heart. Lead me to your heart. Lead me to your heart. Together, lead me to the cross. Where your love poured out, bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me, lead me to the cross. Heavenly Father, it's our joy and privilege to sing to you today, to be in your presence, to listen, to learn, uh, and to worship, Father. Thank you so much uh, for this day. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath. Bless this service. Thank you so much for everyone who's here. Lord, we look forward to hearing from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. All right, well, welcome to Scottsdale Thunderbird Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm Gina Lounsbury, I'm Pastor Dave's wife. Um, thank you, Dana, Alana, and Brooklyn, Brookie, for leading our music today. What a blessing you guys are, TAA students and alumni, if I remember right. Um, we want to welcome any visitors that are here today, those watching online, our members. And I just have to tell you, we missed you guys last week. I hope you guys had an awesome Sabbath, but we're so happy to have our Academy kids back in church with us today. Um, so thank you guys all for coming, and we pray that you're blessed um, during the service today. Yeah, amen. I wanted to add my welcome. Uh, also, I've had a chance to say hello to a few people, um, but uh, still getting to know people, and that's just going to take a while for us as we... Uh, as we get uh, settled here. I feel like the church is going to flip over, though, because we've got so many people on this side. The ship is leaning a bit. Um, Dean Mark, is it a rule that the Academy kids have to sit together, or are they allowed to, they're allowed to sit wherever they want? You guys spend all week together. Can, you can spread out a little bit, can't you? No, it's all right. It's fine. It's fine. We love it. We love it. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, have, have you started listening to Christmas music yet? Raise your hand. How many of you? Oh, I hear some of you groaning. Oh, don't groan. Do any of you have the rule, it has to be after Thanksgiving? Some of you have that. Oh, I see lots of you, that rule. You know, I try that, I do, but I love Christmas so much. I just can't, I, I started switching on the, the radio, just scanning channels, and I came to a Christmas channel, and I stopped, and I said, I'm going to listen to this music, because I love Christmas, so. It's wrong. It's not wrong. It's being festive is what it is. It's, it's being cheerful. Well, um, we, we love to have our worship service. We have a lot of moving parts in a, in a worship service, and we have lots of volunteers. So I thank our worship team for leading out and uh, for being that part of our service. Um, some of the uh, program will flow a little bit differently uh, than is published, but that's okay. Um, we're here to worship the Lord, and we're going to be just fine. Um, we, we are just thrilled that you're here. Um, we don't have a whole lot of other like church announcements and things that need to be said right here. Uh, however, I do want to just address one thing very briefly. I have a lot of people asking questions about uh, the future of our services, and there's still a lot of uh, um, you know lack of clarity because uh, some school districts have closed, um, some states are closing again, and I've been asked, is there anything official that that is that we need to be aware of? And all I can share with you is not right now, not right now. 
Um, there's a rumor that things are going to shut. There's always these types of rumors and things like that. I have not heard anything official from conference leadership or from state leadership or anything else that at least in this context, Scottsdale School District is still open, Paradise Valley closed, but Scottsdale is still open, Cape Creek is still open, uh, Tempe and Mesa are still open. It was a, a regional local thing that Paradise Valley decided to close down. Um, and I haven't heard of other churches or anything going like that. But what will happen next week? We'll find out. Is anyone here a prophet? No, oh, intelligent, wonderful, yes. So um, I just wanted to address that uh, uh, publicly and up front uh, so you have the 411 on that. Um, I don't know of anything happening. We're going to keep going forward until uh, such time as some uh, official declaration goes out like that. So, anyways, uh, did you want to add anything else, Gina? No. She thought long and hard about that. Oh, I do have one other thing. You know you lose a lot of things when you move? You just do. They say three moves is equal to a fire. I thought I'd lost my favorite tie clip, and I found it this morning. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It's the little blessings, isn't it? Those are the wonderful things. So a lot of prayer went up for that tie clip, I know, and God was blessing. So... Anyways, so glad that uh, you are here today. We're going to continue on with our worship service now, and I think George is going to give our offering call. Good morning. Um, today is a special offering. You know, we usually don't like to, to hear the word sacrifice, but today is the annual sacrifice offering. Um, one of the things that uh, we can do um, is, uh, you know, for our society today, the word sacrifice has different connotations. Um, but we as Christians are called to sacrifice, and we have a great example in our Lord in terms of what he did. Um, one of the things that um, makes this special uh, is that we have uh, people that are working uh, in the global mission. They're called global mission pioneers, and they work uh, in all different parts of the world. Uh, and uh, they want to share Jesus and, and to outreach people. So the annual sacrifice offering is for those that are going out in the mission field. And we have an opportunity to share with Thank them you. Thank you, uh, with our offerings for, to go in places that are remote, in villages where there are no other uh, maybe Adventist church or Christian churches nearby. Uh, so that's kind of uh, one of the things that we can do so we can participate. I'm reminded about Paul that you know when he went out on his missionary journeys, he went and he collected offerings to bring them back to Jerusalem, to bring them back to uh, the people that were there. Um, and so that example is something that we can kind of tap into as well. There are places that we can go, uh, but we, through our offerings, we can help those that have gone there in those areas. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a quick little story about a gentleman by the name of Prem. He received some medical training, and, uh, and then he chose to go into a small little um, village with a small stipend in a remote area in India. And uh, Pam, uh, you know, there was no Adventists uh, in, in that area, uh, but he went and he used the talents that the Lord had given him in terms of preparing that. So as he went, he went and he, uh, he took his living room and, and used that area to be a, uh, uh, a, a kind of a treatment room. So he started calling people in from the village and he helped them uh, with their, to transform kind of the way they live, uh, using kind of the things that he had learned uh, as a medical missionary to, to help them, treat them holistically, offered them a different kind of lifestyle, helped them with their illnesses. He would pray for them and he would pray that the heavenly physician to heal them and bless them. And through this small ministry in this small little village, uh, Prem's compassionate words and his actions uh, really showed something to the community. And so some of them started coming, people that he had treated, started coming to uh, church service uh, with him on Sabbath uh, every morning. So Global Mission Pioneers sacrificed much to take Jesus to unreached cities and communities. And that's what our offering uh, today is for. And as the deacons come forward, um, I'll remind the children to come forward also to get their baskets. Um, and. Think about how we can be faithful, just as God is faithful to us, uh, how we can sacrifice to give our offerings and tithes uh, to help those that are in need, those that are not near us, but that we can help influence others that are far away. So um, I remind you to be faithful. Let us have a word of prayer. 
Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your many blessings. You bless us, Lord, and you give us the opportunity to share the gifts that you have given us, to share them with others that are less fortunate, to share them to, uh, with others that are maybe far away living in the mission field. We ask, Lord, that you would bless them, those that are sacrificed uh, and taking their time and, and using their talents, Lord, to be in small villages, just like Prem. And we just ask that you would bless them. And through these offerings, Lord, may your uh, kingdom be furthered. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So kids, come and get your baskets. You have your kids. All right, Caleb. Look, this one already has some money in it. Yes, it'll still get counted. That's good. This is still on, guys. Thank you. Okay, there were more people that were taking up offering than are up here. I saw Owen and he's bailed on me. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, I have a story to tell you today. Do I do closer, farther? I know I always do the microphone wrong. Okay, this is something that happened just a couple of weeks ago. My boss, her name is Nicole, and we work at the conference office. And that's some place that is a workplace that's safe to pray in. You know, some places you can't pray at work. And we can pray at our work. And we do. Well, Nicole was getting ready to move. They were renting a house, and it was being sold, and so she had to find a new place to live. And so she and her husband were packing their things. They found a house that they were going to buy, but it wasn't done yet. It was still under construction. So they were spending their time packing and they were packing and packing and and they the people that owned the house were still showing the house because they're trying to sell it so they had to leave the house very nice and clean and straightened 
So they would pack a box and then they'd put it in the garage. And they'd pack a, a box and they'd put it in the garage so that the house still looked very nice. Well, in all of this topsy-turvy business of having boxes in the garage, packing them, and there was nothing in drawers, but the drawers were closed so they couldn't tell. Nicole lost her wallet. She couldn't find her wallet anywhere. And she looked in some of those boxes that had already been packed. She couldn't find it. She looked in her car. She looked under the seats in her car. She couldn't find it. And she thought, well, it must be at my office. So she came in to work one day, and this is when I became aware of what was happening. She came in to work. She went into her office. She looked on her desk. It wasn't there. She looked on the credenza. It wasn't there. She looked on the chairs that are in her office. It wasn't there. She looked under the chairs. She looked under the desk. It wasn't there. So all this scurrying around in her office, and I stood in the door and I said, what's going on? And she turned around and she said, I can't find my wallet. I've been looking for two days and I can't find my wallet. We're going to close on our house. I don't have an ID. I'm driving without my driver's license. And she burst into tears. She said, I can't even sleep at night because I can't find it. Now, let me tell you something about Nicole. She's what I call a prayer warrior. She is she prays about everything. She prays with everyone. She prays with me when I have something going on. And I, and she, the first thing she wants to do is pray. So I knew if she hadn't been sleeping all night, she was praying. But she still didn't have her wallet. And so often she has said to me, let's pray. So this time, she was the one upset, and I said, let's pray. And so she was so upset, she was crying. So I did the prayer, and I prayed that she would be able to remember where it was. I told Jesus, you know where it is, but Nicole doesn't know where it is. So bring to her mind where she can go and look and give her peace. And when the prayer was over, she opened her eyes. She had quit crying. And she looked at me and she gave me a hug. And she said, thank you for praying with me. I do feel better. And then she looked right at me and she said, I know where it might be. We took my husband's car, which they never take it. They always take her car. We took my husband's car on Sunday to go to the ATM to get some cash because we saw in a yard sale and there was some shelves that they wanted to buy for their new garage. But they needed to pay cash. And so they went to the ATM. She got her phone and she called her husband and he, she said, go look in your car and see if my wallet's in your car. And he went out to the car and sure enough, it had slid in beside the seat and there was her wallet. Now, I know that God answered that prayer. God answers so many of Nicole's prayers. I can't even tell you all the things she's told me. That's how I know she's a prayer warrior. But do you know this one time, this one time, I think that God didn't answer her prayer because he needed to strengthen my faith by letting me help her pray. And so God waited until we prayed together. And then it wasn't even 30 seconds before she remembered where it might be. 
And I think that God did that for me. Because when a prayer gets answered, we feel our our faith gets stronger and stronger. And I hope that by hearing my story, that it will strengthen your faith and help you remember that you can pray about everything. You can pray with your friends. You can pray any time and God will answer. And with that beautiful story, I want to invite everybody who would like to pray and come into the altar as we sing here our prayer, O Lord, because God answers prayers at the right time and in the right way. So if you have a special prayer request, I ask you to please stand and come forward to the altar as um, George Malara will pray for us while we sing here my prayer, O Lord. And uh, I invite you to kneel with us. Our Father God, King of the universe, Father, you spoke things and they existed. There is power in your word and we are here this morning, Lord, to worship you, to praise you for your goodness because you have spoken good things about us. You have called us your sons and daughters. And so, Father, we come this morning to praise you, to worship you and to uh, bring you our adoration uh, because you are worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Dear Jesus, we just uplift you this morning. We want uh, everything that we do to just uh, bring honor and glory to you. Dear Lord, this morning as uh, many have come forward, you know what's on their hearts. Father, I know that there are many in our congregation who are struggling uh, with insecurities about work. There are challenges that they face. Um, Father, there are many who are uh, struggling with COVID, the different things that are going on, uh, just the insecurities. And Lord, we just pray that we might find security in you, that we might put our trust, Lord, not in the things of man, but we can put our trust in you. And so, Father, we just give you thanks for um, your reassurance that we have in your word and your power. Uh, Father, uh, some have come uh, with uh, problems that are physical, uh, emotional, whatever they might be, Lord, Father, you have the answers for all our trials, for anything that we go through, Lord, we know that you care. And so for that, Lord, we give you thanks. And Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. We pray for the transitions. We pray just that you would just uh, give us the assurance that you are in control. Uh, and, we, and we know that and we trust you, Lord. Um, we trust in your word and the power of your word uh, to recreate in us a new heart. And so we ask for that this morning. We pray for your Holy Spirit to come down to be with Pastor Dave as he brings us the message May we be transformed because we have been in your presence. And that's our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Take my 
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Uh, I am here with my friend Andrea, who also goes to TIA with me, and we're going to be singing Love Like This. And this does not want to stay. Um, the reason why we chose this song was to remind everybody that just because we have insecurities and imperfections, it doesn't mean that we should think that we are unworthy of God's love. I'm just going to hold this, yeah. When I am a wasteland, you are the water. When I am the winter, you are the fire that burns, that burns. When I am a long night, you are the sun. desert you are the river that turns to find me what have I done to deserve love like
thank you, Emma and Andrea, so much. It takes a lot of courage, you know, to come up and prepare a song and sing. Thank you guys so much. Are you able to answer the question, what have I done to deserve this? What have I done? You know, you don't have to do anything. You are his child. He loves us because he made us. And despite sin, despite rejection, despite all kinds of problems, he loves us because we are his children. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we worship you today. Lord, we need to hear from you. We need to draw close to you. Lord, you are the only hope for our world. You are the only hope for our souls, Father. So God, as we continue in our worship, as we bask in your presence, as we hear from your word, Lord, come and speak to us once more. Bless us, encourage us, and strengthen us. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I always, you know, I like to thank, you know, all the different people that help uh, with our worship services. It's such a volunteer-driven ministry here in the church, and people come early, they teach classes to the kids, they run sound and video, and they uh, sing up front, they lead out in so many ways. I just want to say thank you to all of our church volunteers uh, for for uh, continuing to work hard, and uh, we sure couldn't do it without you, so thank you so very much. Where's Kelly Sue? Kelly Sue, did you know that I was preaching on prayer today? It is just crazy how that works. It is just crazy, Mark, how it works. And I actually changed my mind late in the week. And um, you're always wondering, God, I have, you know, I got about 30 minutes to share with the church every week. I want it to be the right 30 minutes. You know what I mean? And as I'm preparing my sermon, I'm praying, God, is this the right message? I really need to hear if, if from your Holy Spirit because I don't want to waste anybody's time. These are precious moments that we have together, right? Precious moments. And I want them to count. I want them to mean something. And when God does something like that, Kelly Sue, it just warms my heart. So I'm glad that uh, he, he uh, does those types of connections. And actually, um, Chuck did something during the adult Sabbath school class also that gave me confirmation as well. So anyways, um, yeah, God is good. Amen. So, well, uh, let's get into our kids quiz. Always like to begin with the young people, encourage them to participate and uh, uh, get them off their phones for at least a few minutes. Toby. Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> All right. Question number one. Why do we fold our hands, close our eyes, and bow our heads when we pray? Why do we do that? All right, I, I, I did see you, Gabby, but I saw Owen's hand go up first, so I'm going to go right back to Owen. Owen, what do you got for us? So we close our eyes so we're not distracted, and we fold our hands so we're not doing anything. Toby, did you want to say something as well, or did that pretty much cover it? Yeah, he got it for you. Gabby's got something for us, though. Okay, so a symbol of reverence, bowing your head. These are intelligent young men, aren't they? The, well, is there one more hand that I saw? Um, this is kind of an, open, uh, an open-ended one. There's lots of ways of pointing it. Ryan, did you have something you wanted to say? What, what is it, Ryan? To humble ourselves before God. Yeah, Absolutely. So I remember, I remember distinctly when I was in the third grade, um, when I went to Sunday school, because I grew up in a different church, but the pastor's wife was wonderful. Her name was Darlene Malvaney. Loved Darlene, talented musician, but she was the third grade Sunday school teacher. And I, I still remember this from being in third grade. She did a lesson, probably several weeks, on prayer. And she talked about why we do all these things. And she would ask these, uh, she would say, do you have any questions? And the kids would say, well, why do we fold our hands? And, and she would, she's very demonstrative. She'd say, so we don't have our hands on other people, you know, so we're not doing stuff. Oh, okay. And then, and then someone said, well, why do we close our eyes? And she goes, well, so we can focus on God. We shouldn't be, you know, looking at someone else while we're praying. And then I thought I had her. Oh, I thought I had her. I said, all right, Darlene. I didn't say I said, Mrs. Malvaney, excuse me. <laughs> all right, um, 
uh, Mrs. Malvaney, um, why, and I thought I had her, I said, why do we bow our heads? Because I couldn't think of any practical reason. I mean, it has nothing to do with looking at anyone or touching. I said, you, you explain to me why we bow our heads. And, that, and she said exactly that, Ryan. She said, we do that to humble ourselves and show reverence before God. And guess what? I was the one that was humbled at that moment. I don't remember that. I was probably eight, eight years old or whatever. It's amazing what you remember. So absolutely, oh Lord, you've heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. Now we have to remember that reverence is something that uh, is different in, in different cultures. And the thing that is ironic about these aspects, and I grew up you know, going to church where these things were what you did. You folded your hands, you closed your eyes and bowed your head. That was how you symbolized reverence and prayer. Did you know that in Israel, among the Hebrews, is absolutely reversed? It's absolutely re You would never pray with your hands folded. You would never pray with your eyes closed, and you would never pray with your head bowed. Right? You never would. You were instructed to pray with your head up. You were instructed to pray with your eyes open toward heaven and with your hands spread. If any of you, how many of you have been to Israel? Any of you been to Israel? We need to go. Let's do it. Come on. Let's make something happen here. You see, any Jew praying today, any Orthodox conservative Jew, that's how they pray. Eyes open, head up. Uh, arms out spread. And that's fine. I'm not saying one's right or, or wrong. I'm just saying it's, you know, culturally things are, are different and we have our reasons. Um, but uh, here, here in our context, this is how we express humility. And there's other things too. We can kneel and things like that. All right. Number two, in the Lord's Prayer, we are taught to pray. Give us this day our daily, let's see, is it fish, bread, latte, vitamins? Which one is it? Um, who is that back there? Oh, that's Ketsia. Yeah, I'm pointing at you. She's looking. Gets you? You are right. Uh, you guys all up front. you got to raise your hand, guys. You're throwing it off here. It's serious stuff. Give us this day our daily bread. That's right. That's what we pray as part of the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to move kind of uh, uh, quickly through these next ones. All right, next one. Very important. How often should we pray? How often? Is it on Sabbath, before meals, bedtime, every day, always? And this is Gloria, right? Gloria? Gloria, what do you have to say? She says always. That's a pretty good answer. But I see Caleb in the back. He wants to chime in too. Oh, he says always too. All right. Very good. Ketsia, did you have your hand up? Did you want to say something? It's already been said. It's all of them, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, and I actually heard Chuck say this during Sabbath school in the context of worship, that worship is an attitude as well as an action. So is prayer. Prayer is an action. It's an event. It's something that you do. It can be measured, right, when you start and when you close. But prayer is just as much an attitude. It's about a communal relationship with God, always having our minds filled with the things of God and turning to God uh, with our thoughts and our mind um, at all times. So prayer is both. It's not either or. It's not one or the other. It's both. It's both an attitude and an action. You know, Paul says that we should pray without ceasing, right? And so if you're, if, by the way, if closing your eyes is, is the, the only appropriate way to pray, and we're to pray without ceasing. I hope none of you are praying while you drive, right? You know, so yes, we can have a prayerful attitude um, in all kinds of contexts. All right, in the book, I think this is my last one, in the book, Gospel Workers, it says that prayer is the, quote, the opening of the heart to God as to a, here's some options, pastor, a parent, a father, or a friend. Oh, I've stumped some of you. I see some people. Oh, but I see Anna. I haven't given Anna a chance yet. Anna, what do you say? She said friend. How many of you agree with Anna? Have you heard this quote before? It is correct. You got it on the first try. Now, there's nothing wrong with opening your heart to a pastor or to a parent or to a, a father. I guess that's kind of redundant, parent and father. I didn't think about that until this very second. Um, but uh, Mrs. White says that prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. That's really quite a powerful statement when you think of it, when you think of the context of prayer. Now, there is reverence, as we mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we don't always uh, bow to our friends. We don't, you know, uh, kneel before our friends, uh, usually. Um, but there's an attitude involved here with understanding that God is on our side when we pray to him. God is a good God, and he wants those uh, good things in our life. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of changed uh, stride 
midweek as I was praying uh, and as I was preparing for what I would share uh, this Sabbath. And uh, so the Lord brought the context and the topic of prayer to my heart. And I just want to share with you, this is going to be kind of a one-off. I, I mean, I've done series on prayer. There's, there's never a time that it's not appropriate to talk about prayer. Uh, but this is just going to be a, a one-shot uh, a message on prayer. And I just wanted to throw out the question of, well, why? Uh, why talk about prayer now? Um, well, as I said earlier, it's not, never a bad time to talk about prayer. But I, I guess I would share with you, as I was contemplating this in my heart and as I was putting the thoughts together, uh, it came to me, I can't think of a time when we need to focus more on prayer than right now. And I have shared just an anecdote and in inside things here and there about no matter how you feel about the election, no matter how you feel about COVID, no matter how you feel about whatever's going on, we ought to be praying. We ought to be praying for Joe Biden. We ought to be praying for Donald Trump. We ought to be praying for um, the, the, the health care workers and for, for everyone in, in positions of authority uh, faced with this complex decision about how to navigate uh, the next steps when it comes to mitigating the spread of COVID. We ought to be praying. Now, we talk about that. We kind of give lip service to it. But I wanted to, to dedicate a little bit more time. I just don't think we can talk about prayer enough. And I know you've been, you've heard lots of sermons on prayer. You've read books on prayer. You've done seminars on prayer. You've done 40 days of prayer. You've fasted and prayed. And you're probably thinking, uh, I, I, my eyes are just going to glaze over right now. And my, you know, I, I'm just going to go to, to something else right now because I've heard it all before. So go ahead. But I'm just going to encourage you, just, just stick with me for a moment and, and see if the Holy Spirit has something that will bless you today. Um, Again, prayer is worship. Prayer is an interchange between us and God. Prayer is a necessity of the Christian life. Um, sometimes we think of prayer as a bonus. We think of prayer as, well, if I have time, if I'm not tired, all right, when I get these other things done, when I'm feeling super holy, when I go to church, I'll pray. As though it's this optional luxury to the Christian life. As though it's this bonus, this add-on that is somewhat of a, a, a just a, a last-minute decision. And I've been there, and I've, you know, I don't have it all worked out in my devotional life. I, I, you know, I've heard a lot of people, well, in my three-hour prayer session this morning, I was speaking with the Lord, and they seem very holy, very arrogant. I can't say that to you. I, I, I'm still working out these things in my own life, but one thing I do have deep conviction about is that the church of Jesus Christ would be much stronger today if we were a, a, a stronger people of prayer. If we were a stronger people of prayer. We cannot overstudy, overemphasize, overpromote the need and power and beauty of a spiritual life that is saturated in holy, intentional, personal prayer. There will never be a time when we can ignore prayer. How many of you have ever known someone, and this, is, this has happened to me a few times in my life, it's actually quite rare, where you just, you're in someone's presence and you know they're a person of prayer. You know what I'm talking about? I've known a handful of people. Um, one was an elder at the church uh, in, in, uh, in Walla Walla, where we went when I was at school, um, at the Eastgate Church. Um, just being in his presence, he was a man of prayer. And he didn't brag about it. He didn't talk about it. You just knew that this man had been in the presence of God very recently. And there was a joy about him. There was a strength about him. There was a courage. There was a confidence. There was a wisdom. Am I the only one here? Has anyone else ever had that experience with just someone that has been very impactful on their life where you can just tell this person has communed with the Lord? Would it be that more of us could, could exude that aura about us that we have this connection with the God of the universe? We would be able to be a much more powerful people. So I just want to look at one verse in the Gospel of Luke very briefly with you and draw out a few thoughts about this verse. It's, we understand the context. This is Luke's kind of Sermon on the Mount uh, and, and Lord's Prayer, uh, 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 how he shares it from his perspective uh, here in Luke chapter 11. Uh, and so he'll give his uh, words about the Lord's Prayer here in Luke 11. And I'm just going to look at the first verse with you for a second, one you're probably familiar with. Um, and Luke says it this way in Luke 11 verse 1. He says, it happened. And, you know, I'm kind of a, a person, I look at every word, and I just think, he's saying something dramatic here. He's saying that something significant happened. It happened. Well, what happened? 
it happened that while Jesus was praying, okay, this is something that Luke gives us that Matthew doesn't, and they may have been different circumstances. We can talk about that later. But it says that Luke says that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he'd finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as the disciples, just as John also taught his disciples. Now, when you get into the story and you think about it, Jesus, they are observing Jesus pray. That's what it says. They, that Jesus, while he was praying, so obviously they're not praying with their eyes closed. Uh, they're, they're observing, they're watching, they're listening, they're hearing. And they're observing Jesus pray. And something spurs in their heart and their mind. They say, wow, that's different. Uh, that's not what I'm accustomed to. I, I have more to learn about prayer because when I hear Jesus pray, I, 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 that's different. Okay, you, you see that there? And keep in mind, although they were poor and although they, although they were uneducated uh, disciples, uh, they had been through their bar mitzvah. They were well educated in the things of the temple. They were well educated in the formalities and the, uh, the, the practices of the Jewish uh, worship. They had been taught all the Jewish prayers. They had been taught all the Jewish customs. So they were not ignorant in the things of of, of temple worship and of prayer. But when they saw Jesus pray, they realized they still had a lot to learn when they saw the Lord pray. And I love this, this uh, reality of what it says. One of the disciples comes to Jesus, but he's obviously speaking for them all because he says, teach us. Right? He's not just speaking, isn't it? teach me. He says, teach us. They come to them. Uh, one of the disciples comes to Jesus and says, look, would you teach us to pray? Now, as far as I know, this is the only time. Now, Jesus was a rabbi. He's a teacher. He does. He's obviously teaching parables, and, and his ministry is, is greatly one of teaching. Um, but this is the only time that I'm aware of in, in the New Testament where anyone comes to Jesus, any of the disciples come to Jesus and specifically ask that the Lord would teach them a spiritual practice like this. Now, when Jesus sent out the, the, the 72 and he blessed them, it says he gave them the power they could preach and they could drive out demons and they could heal uh, the lepers and they could even raise the dead. But it wasn't as though they came to him and said, Jesus, teach us to preach. Jesus, teach us to heal. Jesus, teach us to drive out the demons. Now, he did that through illustration and parable and all those things. But in this circumstance, it's the only time I know of where the disciples come to Jesus and they ask for a specific uh, blessing, a specific lesson on one spiritual attribute. And it just happened to be on the attribute of prayer. Teach us to pray. We've prayed our whole lives, Lord. We've seen how the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the rabbis have taught to pray. We see how prayer is done in the temple. But when you pray, there's something we're missing. We want to learn what it is. Teach us to pray. If you could ask Jesus Christ to teach you one thing today, what would it be? If you had one thing, it's kind of like in, in, with Solomon, right? Um, when the Lord came to Solomon and said, anything you want, just ask of it and I'll give it to you. It's kind of like the genie out of the bottle, what I'm going to ask for, right? If you could ask the Lord to teach you one thing, what would it be? Love? Sure. I would share with you that this is the foundation and basis for which all good spiritual things flow from. Teach us to pray. I think it's the right perspective. Yes, we need to learn to love. We need to learn to preach. We need to learn to be witnesses. We need to learn prophecy. We need to learn not to be discouraged. Well, how do we do those things? Prayer. How do you not be discouraged? Get in the presence of the God of the universe. It's hard to be discouraged there. How are we going to understand prophecy? Well, go to the one who knows the future in prayer. Right? How are we going to learn to love? Bask in the presence of one who is love. Lord, teach us to pray. So how do we spend our days as Americans? Well, we can throw lots of statistics up here. We can say lots of things. I'm just going to throw a few up here as anecdotes. On average, Americans spend about 24 minutes a day getting dressed. 24. So that means for those of you spending one or two minutes, you know, on average, there's others that are spending an hour or two, right? Okay, 24 minutes a day getting dressed. I don't know if that includes hair or not. Maybe. 
What's the next one? Talking on the phone or texting. Okay, this is not work related, by the way. This is just uh, uh, you know outside of, of business and things. About 40 minutes. That used to be much higher, but things have changed, obviously, in how we communicate. This one gets me using the bathroom. I knew we had problems in America, but man, 60 minutes a day on average, on average, 60 minutes a day. Boy. Television and the internet, again, this used to be a lot higher, but there's other things in our life. About three hours. You could throw video games in there too. Now we know that within the last oh, f few years, I'd say, the, 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 the greatest uh, 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 eater up of our time, to say it indelicately, is social media. Two years ago, this was two hours. Okay, so in 2017... Uh, it was two hours. In 2019, the average American spends four hours engaging with uh, social media every single day. That is a lot of cat videos. So what about prayer? By the way, these are surveys. These are done through statistical things. And by the way, what I'm about to share with you is done by Christian researchers asking Christians. So Barna, Foster, and Rayner all have done a Christian research. And when they ask someone, they, the first question is, are you a Christian? If they say yes, the question is, well, how much do you pray? Okay. And this is their response. 15 to 30 minutes per week. That's what Christians have confessed to. 15 to 30 minutes for the entire week. And it's, you know, because different statistics, Barna, you know, about 15, Foster is more like 20, and I think Rainer um, got all the way up to 30 when they did this research. This is fairly recent, too. 15 to 30 minutes is what Christians say they're praying. Do we have some distractions in our life and in our world? Do we have some things that are interfering with this critical spiritual devotion? Do you think Satan hates prayer? Do you think Satan is trying to keep you from praying? He is, by the way. If he could keep you from doing anything. He's, go to church. Sure, go to church. Uh, yeah, study your lesson. Uh, listen to the great music. Just don't pray. And he's got you. He has absolutely got you. So um, just to throw out a few things here, and again, I know, uh, I know that there's more to this than that, but let's just identify some of the biggest things that interfere uh, with our prayer life. Okay, What's interfering with you having a contemplative, prayerful life? Well, again, historically and, and of a generation ago, it was television, right? Television used to be the big evil. Oh, television is rotting your brain. Stop it, okay? Uh, video games, television, movies, all that. Uh, and it still is a big distraction. Still is a major element. Uh, Americans and, and Christians and all, everyone alike is dedicating a whole lot of time to sitcoms and dramas and movies and series and binge watching. And with uh, streaming services, uh, which we have them, I'm not condemning them, but you can binge watch an entire season of whatever and uh, you, can, you can spend 16 hours on the television and you don't even realize it, right? So television is still a big and major distraction for us today. Sports. Um, I get distracted by sports. I'll let you know. I do. Um, it, it's, it's the, it, it, sports is the American religion more than anything else, um, and we could talk about that more. And, of course, recently, uh, but really at all times, politics. You know, I know people that eat, chew, swallow, breathe politics 24-7, and uh, – they're not happy people either, by the way. I'll just share with you, they're not. Um, it's just, uh, it's a challenge. Work, work or school. And I'm not saying that either one is wrong, bad, or anything like that. But sometimes it can get so overwhelming in your work or your school uh, that, again, prayer becomes an afterthought. Prayer becomes, oh, I'd pray, except I got to do this. I got to do this thing right here. I got to take care of that. And I'm not saying to shirk your duties in work or school. Um, but the devil wants to use them to keep you from praying. Just flat out, he will. If you had to choose, 
between spending a thoughtful hour in prayer or studying for a test, which one would you do? I know, you can be honest about it, but um, I think it hurts, uh, it hurts our ability to be uh, strong believers and having that connection with uh, the source of all knowledge uh, and, and the strength that we need. But really the biggest interference that we have today, if you take all those things and combine them, they are all on one device. Your sports are here, your television is here, your news is here, your work is here. For most of us today, and by the way, our young people are the first generation growing up with this as the premier device. They are the ones weathering this reality. For me, it was kind of the dawn of the internet, right? Um, for some of you, there were other things. <laughs> the refrigerator, that was the big deal, right? <laughs> but this is the first generation that is attempting to weather the interference and distraction of the smartphone. And are we winning this battle? You know, I like to camp. And one of my favorite things about camping is that technology goes by the wayside. If you can, you know, and I have, I have cousins and friends, they'll bring their computers and smartphones up camping and they're searching for signals and whatnot. I'm like, why are you even here? Why are you even here? Come on, unplug for just a few moments. So um, interference and distractions are a major challenge that we have in the church today. And the devil is an expert. He's an expert and helping us set aside the key component of our spiritual relationship with God for other things that may be good things. The Bible says, He who turns away his ear from listening to the law, even his prayer, even his prayer is an abomination. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Sin keeps us from God. Sin keeps us from understanding the power of prayer. Now, I know you've all... Well, probably most of you have heard this before, but the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. And I mentioned earlier that this is kind of a one-off service, a one-off sermon on the topic of prayer. So I just want to pack one more little element in here. Something that has been a blessing to my prayer life, and I know many of you have heard this before, and it's very simple, very trite, but I think it can actually be very um, helpful. I use prayer like an acronym, P-R-A-Y. You've, you've probably heard this before. What does P stand for? Praise. Praise. When you pray, always begin first with acknowledging who God is. He is holy. He is righteous. He is God. I'll get into these a little bit more here in a second. What do you think the R stands for? It's going to stand for repent. Repent. Get your heart right with God. Get your heart right uh, with whatever is uh, sinfully preventing you from seeing his will. The A is ask. Now, we usually rush right to the ask, right, when we pray. Uh, Dear Lord, would you help me today with this and that? And I also need this and that. And God, if you'd also do this and that. Be honest, right? A lot of our prayers today, we just rush right to the ask. Uh, I think it's good to begin with some reflection first. And then the why would be yield. How many of you have seen this before? Okay, I did not invent this. This is very common. Uh, I, uh, I know some have used Acts before, ACTS, uh, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication, all that. I like pray. It's just much more straightforward. When you pray, think of your prayer following this sequence. Now I'm going to just go into this a little bit more. Why praise first? And the, by the way, this does follow the Lord's Prayer, not uh, perfectly in sequence, but it, it captures some of the essence of the elements of the Lord's Prayer. The Lord begins the Lord's Prayer by saying, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, who's in heaven, is holy. Right? That's the first part of the prayer. What are you doing? You are saying, before I go anywhere in this discussion with God, before I ask for a thing, before I do anything, I need to acknowledge that He is God and I'm not. I need to acknowledge that he is holy, that he is powerful, that he is the creator, that he is glorious, and that he loves me, and he has a plan for my life. That is the way we should begin all of our prayers, whether they're personal, uh, corporate, whatever it is. Always begin your prayers with acknowledging, first and foremost, God, you are in heaven, you are there, you are powerful, and I need you. 
Okay? Just try that. Secondly, repent. And again, it doesn't follow the exact sequence of the Lord's Prayer, but we know that repentance is part of the Lord's Prayer. It says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now listen to this verse in Mark eleven twenty-five. 25. Whenever you stand praying, how often? Once a week? When you feel like it? Here, Jesus says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, uh, uh, for, excuse me, when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. You should never enter into a prayer session with God with unrepented sin or holding grudges against someone else. It becomes a barrier to your spiritual growth and to hearing the voice of the Lord. You know, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, when you bring your gift to the altar, if in bringing your gift you remember that your brother has something against you, not you have something against your brother, you just know that your brother has something against you. He says, stop, leave your gift there. First, go be reconciled with your brother. Then come back and offer your offering. And that's what we do when we pray. When we come before the Lord, it should be a time of introspection. We praise Him. We recognize who He is. We proclaim His glory and His holiness. And then we ask Him, search my heart, Lord. See if there be any wickedness in me. Cleanse me. This is so important so that we begin with a clean slate when we pray to God. When was the last time you sought to be reconciled with someone you knew had something between you and them before you went and prayed to God. It is instructive. It is what we are taught to do. It is in Scripture. It's there black and white. But we still need to be taught how to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Repent. Cleanse our hearts. That's what David prayed, right? After his sin with Bathsheba, cleanse my heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Number three, that this is the one we always uh, jump to, but it's nothing wrong. We are to ask. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. Supplication. Supplication just means a humble request. By supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. God loves to hear our requests. He's never bothered by our requests. He's never annoyed by our, 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 uh, our prayers. Even the simple things, Lord, help my, my puppy. He's got his, uh, his tail closed in the door, and he's kind of help him. God loves that. The, your requests don't always have to be the big things. Lord, bring world peace. Bring it all over the world. Now, God wants to bring world peace, but he cares about even the number of hairs on your head. He sees the sparrows that fall. He wants you to bring your request to him. But it will make a world of difference if you begin by learning from the pattern and from the order that God has given us. Acknowledge who he is. Praise him. Repent. Cleanse your heart. And then in that context, then ask. You might find after doing the first two that the things you thought you were going to ask no longer matter. By the time you get done praising God for who he is and having him cleanse your heart, the things you thought were a burden sometimes are already eliminated. All of a sudden, perspective comes into your life. And you think, well, I was going to pray about this, but after being in God's presence, seeing who he is and feeling his, his cleansing hand upon my heart, I now have a whole different direction that he's calling me to go. telling you it makes a difference and then yield we all we so often leave this out we go through our laundry list we go through our wish list we get up off our knees or we go out of our prayer closet and we go off our way and we forget to listen how many of you like being parts of conversations where the only person talking is the other person and you don't get a word in is that a fun relationship where they're, nah, 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 nah. well well sorry i gotta go okay Prayer is a relationship with God. We need to listen as much as we speak. Be still. Know that I am God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a submitting to the will of God. Now that I've asked, now that I've repented, now that I've praised you, I'm ready to listen. Sounds simple, doesn't it? You've heard it before maybe or something similar. Let me just share from the Lord's Messenger several little quips on prayer because they're just encouraging to my heart. 
Prayer is the unbroken union of the soul with God. Prayer is the key, the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse. Prayer is the most holy exercise of the soul. Now, that's a big one. It's the most holy. It's more than preaching. It's more than prophecy. It's more than anything else. It's the most holy exercise of the soul. Prayer is the life of the soul, the foundation of spiritual growth. Prayer is the breath of the soul. By the way, I'm not giving you the references, okay? If you want to see what Mrs. White has to say on prayer, look them up yourself. Because <laughs> there's a whole list of them. I cycled through just a few to pull out some of my favorite. Prayer is the strength of the Christian. Do you feel weak? Do you ever feel kind of discouraged? Do you ever feel a little bit low? Pray. It's the strength of the Christian. It's it. I think, was it in Job that it says, I have esteemed the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food? Have you heard that one before? I think it's Job 31, Mark. You want to look that one up for me? If you had to choose between breakfast and prayer, which one is going to strengthen you more? Preaching to myself here, guys. Prayer is the only safety, the only safety for both young and old. Prayer is the spirit which yields mind, heart, and will to God. Prayer is the weapon by which we resist the enemy. And I think that's in combination with the word, of course. Prayer is the Christian's defense, the safeguard of his integrity and virtue. Prayer is the very essence of pure religion. Prayer is the source of power. And that's exactly how she says it. Prayer is the source of power. How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? I know my needs work. I know that I need to start setting aside some distractions. I know that I need the Holy Spirit more in my life today than ever, ever, ever before. And we would be a much different and stronger people if we understood and allowed God to teach us more about prayer. Oswald Chambers is my favorite Christian author outside of um, the Spirit of Prophecy. And this is one of my favorites. Prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Isn't that good? Prayer is the greater work. So, what am I saying? Lord, teach us to pray. Ask Jesus to help you. Go to the Lord and say, I've grown up in church, or maybe not, but I've seen lots of prayer, but I know I have a lot to learn. Be honest. Be transparent with the Lord. Ask Him. Watch out for the things that interfere with your prayer life. The devil will throw them at you like crazy. And he'll make you think that you're doing good things by avoiding prayer. Oh, but I'm volunteering for this great organization. Oh, but I'm doing good things over here. Oh, but I'm taking care of this business over here. It's a distraction, guys. And it's killing us. It's absolutely killing the church killing spiritual life and then make the most of your prayer time by trying this simple pattern in your prayers i you know i know it sounds like very formulaic and 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 all that just try it, it and i'm not saying it has to be a, a an hour-long session just even in a quick 30 second prayer remember praise him first ask for his forgiveness make your requests and then just take a breath and pause for five seconds even in as little time as that, you will notice a different spiritual experience with God. I, I think you really will notice that it makes a difference. You may have a different pattern. I'm not saying this is the only way. I'm not saying this can't be amended or altered. But this is at least one way that I think satisfies a very important um, lesson when it comes to our prayer life. Well... Um, you know, in a, in a perfect system, I could say, well, I have uh, little commitment cards to hand out. I want everyone to sign a card saying I commit to praying more than 30 minutes a week and I'm going to make this. List. I don't have that for you today. What I'm going to do as I close right now is I'm just going to pray for all of us. I'm going to pray that the Lord would bless and touch all of us and renew in our hearts a commitment and a dedication to being a people of prayer. 
Father, Lord Jesus, this is not intended to be uh, a criticism, Father, or a lecture or a put down. Um, I know some of us are experiencing greater degrees of, of a devotional life that's filled with prayer uh, than others, Father. But it seems like this is a critical time, a critical juncture in our history right now where we are facing more complexity and more crisis and more chaos than we're accustomed to. And Father, we know that the devil is doing everything he can to keep us up off our knees, to keep us away from our prayer closets, to keep us from even praying for our food. We rush through. But Father, I pray that everyone who's hearing my voice right now, that everyone who is listening right now would hear your voice speak to them and invite them to a committed life of prayer. We all have a lot to learn. Help us, Father. Lord, teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. So glad that you're here. Um, have a wonderful Sabbath. Hope to see you again next week. God bless.